Welcome friends, greetings from the breaking grounds, taking roots, the Istanbul principles at 7, a potentially game-changing meeting of hundreds of civil society champions from around the world, along with some government representatives happening currently in Bangkok, Thailand. CNS Managing Editor Shobha Shukla spoke with Justin Kilkullin, European representative to the CSO Partnership for Development Effectiveness, or CPDE, and Chair of Social Justice Ireland. Justin Kilkulin also represents Irish NGOs in CPDE framework. Without any further ado, let's listen to Justin Kilkulin of CPDE in conversation with Shobha from CNS. Standard principles being helpful in the past seven years for increasing effectiveness and accountability of CSOs as development actors. I think they have. Of course, uh, they are very ambitious. Uh, you have eight principles that are putting forward best practice. So we all aspire to best practice and we don't always reach it and I suppose we never will. But what it has done is, is uh, highlighted for NGOs and CSOs that uh, we are at our best, and that's the word that's used, we are at our best when we practice gender equity. We are at our best when we approach things with a human rights based approach. We are at our best, our best when we show solidarity with each other when we have a relationship that is one of equality rather than one based on power or based on financial resources. And we're at our best when we're sharing with each other and learning from each other. So it's been seven years and I think that many, many organizations, civil society organizations in the South and the North have taken on these principles and have tried to put them into effect. And um, I know of one organization in Ireland where I come from who completed a uh, an audit recently and they scored themselves at 75 percent. That was pretty good actually, uh, even if they exaggerated slightly. I mean, if you get me to over 70 percent, it means that you're making a real effort. And of course, we always hope that nobody would ever get 100 percent because that would mean that there, there's no room to improve. Uh, and I think it has also been seen in the way that civil society has now been accepted as an authentic and uh, autonomous voice in development circles. Um, in, uh, the Busan Declaration gave that recognition that civil society is an autonomous development actor and was reaffirmed just three months ago in Nairobi at the high level meeting. And one of the reasons that uh, that reaffirmation came was because of the Istanbul principles. Because we were able to demonstrate to the development community that uh, we are being responsible about ourselves, we are striving for best practice and we are being accountable. And of course, we want governments to be all of those things and we can't really ask that of others if we're not that ourselves. What have been the challenges that we have confronted in implementing the Istanbul principles over the last seven years? Well, from my own personal experience, I think the question of uh, equitable relationships is a challenge. Uh, I'm fortunate to come from a wealthy country, Ireland in the north, I worked for many years with an Irish NGO that had a lot of resources, over 65 million a year. Our partners were small civil society organizations in the, the South uh, without these kind of resources. So when you have the money in the equation, it, it, it gives you power. So how do you release that power uh, so that there is a, 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 a partnership of equals? Uh, particularly if your government, who might have given you a substantial amount of this money, is looking for a report and demanding that certain standards be met and uh, they want to see outcomes and so on and you kind of get caught in the middle of accountability. To whom are we accountable? Is it to our partners to ensure that we behave in the right way or is it to our donor who gave the money? And uh, this, is a, this is a challenge for, for northern NGOs. I suspect it's also a challenge for southern civil society because we see many of our partners in CPTE are quite sophisticated organizations based in capital cities, people with education and income and who travel the world. And the organizations they represent are in far flung parts of rural areas who never get to sit in a four star hotel like we're sitting in now. That's an also a challenge for an equitable relationship. So this goes up and down the chain. It's not just uh, geographic or regional or whatever. It is a challenge for all of us. Uh, because where there's money and where there's power at play, then that is something that has to be negotiated. How do you envision 
redefinition of accountability and effectiveness of all actors in development cooperation. Well, I'm not so sure we need to redefine it as we just need to understand it and to implement it. And, um, and I think that is, I mean, the other one is about sustainability. We all talk about sustainability, um, but uh, so much of our work can be short term, like uh, three year projects funded on a three year budget. And then what happens at the end of it? Uh, where is the long-term commitment of staying with partnerships? Partnerships don't just form and then break up. If you're a partner, you can be a partner for life. And uh, so how do you handle, handle that relationship in terms of uh, sustainable partnerships? And in terms of the work itself, unless there's follow through, unless you were able to carry this on for quite a number of phases of a project, very often you'll find that the, uh, the benefits are lost because uh, for some reason or other, it wasn't possible to see it through to its conclusion. Uh, a three-year program doesn't necessarily give you, get you to the end point in these kind of projects to involve community and society and economic issues, social issues, complex things that can't be resolved in short-term programs. So, so what is the way forward? Well, I think the way forward is uh, to make these principles a reality in our lives um, I think in terms of Agenda 2030, for instance, I think one of, the, um, one of the big drawbacks of Agenda 2030, the SDGs, is it's not a transformative agenda. I think uh, the SDGs have fallen into the same trap as the MDGs, which is we promise to change everything, lift everybody out of poverty, leave nobody behind, but we don't tackle the basic economic and social structures that create this problem. So there's an element of if we throw money at it and technical solutions and we work really hard that we're going to solve this problem. And I don't think that's going to happen, frankly. Uh, we know that one of the big problems in today's world is growing inequality. And I don't see that uh, although the question of inequality is present in the uh, Agenda 2030, I don't see the structure there to really tackle that. The Istanbul principles are the basis on which we as civil society can make the Agenda 2030 a transformative agenda. It means living them out ourselves and in our advocacy work, uh, really putting pressure on other development actors, governments, both uh, partner governments, donor governments, uh, the other sectors like the, uh, the funds and the philanthropic funds, uh, the private sector, of course, which is a big issue in Agenda 2030, that they too need to transform how they work if this uh, agenda is to be fulfilled in the way it should be. And uh, so the Istanbul principles are our charter for that work and we can only proclaim it as loudly as we practice it. And that is the challenge for us. Civil society space shrinking and how can Istanbul principles be helpful and useful in helping safeguard this civil society space? I think it is. The, 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 the reports from all of our member countries, uh, even now in the European Union, uh, we see uh, governments moving to the right in Poland, in Hungary, uh, clamping down on civil society. And the European Union is one of the biggest aid donors in the world. 60% of all aid comes through the European Union. So that's worrying. If uh, even within the Union itself, you see this contradiction between what is proclaimed as our ideals and then what people do. Um, and of course, uh, we see throughout the southern countries still a big gap between the legal systems that might be in place and what actually happens. And uh, governments are somehow, uh, many countries, nervous of civil society. I think particularly if in Parliament there is not a strong opposition, civil society is perceived as in opposition to government. I mean, it is the role of citizens and citizens' organizations to hold their governments to account. But uh, governments say, well, no, we're not accountable to you, we're accountable to Parliament. But if Parliament is weak, it means there's no accountability at all. So these are some of the issues that see civil society come on, coming under a lot of pressure, being accused of being disloyal because they're not supporting the government, of being uh, rebellious and you know, mavericks because they won't fall in line with government policy. I mean, a lot of the, uh, the, uh, the views of civil society, I think, about many governments is 
uh, you're free to operate as long as you're oper operating within our policy framework. And we might say, well, okay, in principle, if that's what you want, but first of all, we have to participate in the, uh, pr the formulation of those policies. And so often, uh, there is no real participation in that. And civil society, in all honesty, cannot implement programs that they would perceive as being against the interests of people because they are maybe supporting uh, local landowners or uh, your companies that have a vested interest, often um, promoted by senior politicians who might gain personally from what is going on, all of that stuff. And uh, that's why civil society is proud to, we won our, this state is being an autonomous actor. But very often ministers, governments don't recognize that, not only in the south, but in the north as well. Thank you very much, Justin. But anything yep. else you would like to share? Well, I think uh, Agenda 2030, uh, I mean, I, can't, I don't want to say it's a bad thing because it creates a detailed agenda with 169 targets to 17 goals. Um, you know, we can work with that. We can use this uh, as a means to promote the rights-based approach agenda that we believe underlies true sustainable development. And um, so we have to engage with it. Uh, and we have to find the good bits in it. We have to be seen as constructive partners, not just knocking or complaining all the time. Uh, we have to find allies uh, who will support our views. Uh, many parliamentarians are on our side. Many officials in, in the governments and you know, bodies like the UN, the EU are on our side. Uh, parliamentarians, local authorities, there are many there that share our view on many of these things and that's why we need to build those relationships. We can't do this alone. It's not civil society against the world. It's civil society reaching out into all the other uh, development actors, finding common ground and together maybe we can make something more of Agenda 2030 than it appears to be at the moment. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you. you. We were listening to Justin Kilcullen, European representative to the CSO Partnership for Development Effectiveness, or CPDE, and chair of Social Justice Ireland. Justin also represents Irish NGOs in CPDE framework. Justin was in conversation with CNS Managing Editor Shobha Shukla. For more details, be welcome to check out CPDE website at www.csopartnership.org. Thanks for listening and stay tuned.